So when we get the life of the Prophet ﷺ, you will literally see the Qur'an, you know, in walking and talking, you know, as Aisha anha, described the Prophet ﷺ. So, so, so therefore, it is of critical importance uh, for people to go through the story, to live the experiences of the Prophet ﷺ, because these experiences are the base of revelation. So the Qur'an did not come down as a single book, but it is an answer to issues happening over this 23-year period. Mm. So when we understand the life of the Prophet ﷺ, we are understanding the context. And so the context is so important. And then it gives us uh, living solutions to the problems we're facing today. Allah Azza wa Jal then um, sent a messenger who was the seal of all the prophets and messengers who came, and through him came the last revelation. And, and so by getting that completion, then we're actually touching on the essence of what Islam is in its final form. It's important um, for us to be able to release ourselves from present day names and constructs uh, when we are looking at history. Even if people look back at their maps uh, 30, 40 years ago, they would see the Soviet Union, um, which no longer exists on the map. Now it's Russia and it's broken into many states. So therefore, historical maps, historical understanding gives the context. Now, we have to take a big leap back. We're talking about going back to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu We're talking about the 6th century. And for the time before him, we're actually talking about the early part of this uh, millennium, even BC, mm. because this story goes into the, the time of BC, the ancient times. Mm. Uh, and, and so it, it's important to, 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 to put it in its proper perspective. And by putting it in its proper perspective, then we understand um, the importance of the Arabian Peninsula mm. and how it fit right in with the last revelation. Mm -hmm. So this is important to keep in mind all the time, is that this is going to be the base of the last revelation to all of humanity. So this is Jazeera Tal Arab. This is the Arabian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And Jazeera is used in a sense that normally you think of Jazeera as an island. Yeah. Um, but this is really a peninsula. But when you look at it geographically, the northern part is covered by a sea of sand. So it was literally cut off from the rest of the world. And it is in this desolate place, this ancient uh, world, that the final revelation comes. And when you look at the sixth century, you will see that the great powers uh, of the world and one of the great philosophers of ancient Persia um, named Mani, this is somewhere around fourth century or so, but he said there's, there's four great powers in the world, same way we have United States, we have Russia, mm. we have NATO, China. But there were four great powers at that time. One was the Roman Empire. The other was the per Persian Empire. The third uh, was three kingdoms in China. So he was looking at the whole world. Yeah. And the fourth, surprisingly enough, was in Africa. It was the Aksumite Empire. So that was considered to be one of the four great powers on earth. And then there was the Arabian Peninsula. But, when, but when you look at the, at the world, you will see the Arabian Peninsula is sort of like a crossroads. It's sort of like in between uh, these empires. The Arabs were generally seen as Bedouin type people, even the word Arab itself, Arabi. Mm. You know, it, 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 it does give the meaning of like a, a wasteland, somebody who's living in a desert. Mm. Uh, and generally, the Arabian Peninsula was known, you know, for that. Except, of course, for the south. Now, in the south where Yemen uh, was, was, there were great civilizations. Although, of course, Yemen is still connected to the desert. Uh, but because of the frankincense and the myrrh and, and the spices coming out of the south, um, the Romans knew about civilizations. But they never gave it much weight because they are materialistic people. And in terms of materials, the Arabian Peninsula did not have the palaces, it did not have the huge armies, the carpets, the porcelains, all of the different aspects of so-called civilization. 
uh, but they were known to be uh, resolute people, uh, people with a very complex type of language, and people who had this uh, resilience to be able to travel long distances and to survive uh, in very difficult circumstances. The Arabian Peninsula, Jazeera al Arab, was considered to be a wasteland, mm. and it's a place where nobody really wants to pass through. You got to find a way around it and not go through it. If we look at the world in terms of the chronology uh, of you know, the Earth and the shifting of the Earth, uh, scientists tell us that there was a great valley called the Rift Valley. Mm. And that Rift Valley went you know, from uh, uh, East Africa, uh, Kenya and even below, all the way up right into Palestine. And, and, and that valley, it was that valley that split, um, that made the Red Sea. Mm. So in ancient times, and I'm talking thousands of years ago, Africa was connected to Arabia. There was no separation. And even if you look at the two uh, sides after the split, the Red Sea is not a major barrier. Mm. Yeah. So therefore, um, the, the, the peoples of Africa who migrated to different parts of the world, and so in the same way that they migrated north and went to the Sahara Desert um, of North uh, Africa, they went across the Mediterranean, they went to different areas. Uh, so they migrated into this Arabian Peninsula uh, area mm -hmm. and they settled uh, in that area, keeping their connection uh, with the people across the Red Sea, especially the people in what is now known as uh, the Sudan, Djibouti, uh, Somalia, and, and those areas. Really, there was not much uh, separation. However, with time and through the changes in history, um, the Arabian Peninsula took on a special significance. Mm -hmm. But in the ancient times, uh, it was really just a place that people would cross through uh, in, in order to get somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the historians and linguists uh, look at the ancient Arabs, and I'm talking thousands of years ago, as first being Al-Arab Al-Ba'idah. Mm -hmm. And so this is what you could call the perishing Arabs. These are the ancient societies. And the Qur'an speaks about Ad and Tamud mm. and Madai and Saleh. Uh, there are still ruins there in the Arabian Peninsula of these ancient societies. But for the most part, although they were speaking a type of proto-Arabic, it was uh, a Semitic language, which some say is the original Semitic language, mm. um, they for the most part um, died out and their languages died out because of mm. the droughts and because of destructions and things that happened. So they are perishing Arabs. The only thing left from them, I visited the country of Oman. And in Oman, there are some people who are speaking a language. Mm. It's not Arabic. Mm -hmm. And it's considered to it's be... Not, it's not modern day Arabic. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's like, a, it's, it's not even, you know, patois, colloquial yeah. Arabic. It is something else. Mm. And the Romani said, this is the remnants of this ancient language that was there. Um, of, of Al Arab Al Baida. The second group you could call um, Al Arab Al Ariba. Mm. So these are the pure original Arabs. And I think that most historians and linguists do agree on the fact that the, the original Arabs came out of the Yemen. Yeah. So it is from the Yemen um, that you find the pure form of the Arabic language. And then you will find the tribes that migrated to different places. Mm. Even if you look at places like uh, Medina, uh, Yathrib, the house in the Khazraj, and you go back and you'll see they originally came out of Yemen. Yeah. If you look back at many different parts of what is now the Arabian Peninsula, so it comes out of Al Arab and Araba. Mm. So this is the pure original Arabs. And the third group is uh, Al Arab al Mustaraba. Mm. And so these are the uh, uh, Arabicized mm. Arabs. So these are people who took on the culture uh, of the Arabs, but mainly the language. Mm. They took on the language and, and they came into the Arab world. And so today, if you look at the Arab world and you had a meeting of all the Arab states and you had a Moroccan delegate mm. uh, speaking to a Lebanese delegate, very far off. They might not understand each other. Yeah. Only 10% of the, unless they spoke classical Arabic. Yeah. If they spoke classical Arabic, then they could, but it is because the, the, the Lebanese were originally Phoenicians, so they had their own language. The Moroccans and Algerians were originally Amazigh, they were Berber, 
So they had their own language. And then they took on Arabic and gave it sort of their own accent, their own nuance uh, and whatnot. So these are the three groups um, you could say that make up what we now know as the Arab world. And when you look at the Arabian Peninsula, uh, we'll see that 90% of it or more uh, is Sahra, it's yeah. desert. And living in the desert um, requires uh, resilience, courage, strength, and it requires unity. So therefore, it was natural for human beings to come together in strong units. Mm. And so it is these units that adapted to different sections of the Arabian Peninsula and defended their land um, and built their traditions and their customs you know, around themselves. And generally, they were an oral culture. Yeah. So they would also transmit you know, their lineage um, and, and it became very important to them in terms of their lineage. And you'll see that you know, tribalism or the fact that you're in a certain tribe, in some cases, uh, would save your life. Mm -hmm. so, so similarly with the Arabs, they would identify themselves through the tribes as a means of survival, subsistence, um, as a means of unity, as a means of bargaining with other tribes uh, in order to form larger groups, which eventually uh, could come into nations. But it starts with that family, and then it goes to a higher you know, stage. Um, and I would say that really survival is the basis of it. It's not just a matter of pride. Um, it's not racism, mm. because Arabs are light-skinned, brown-skinned, dark-skinned. It, it's yeah. not really a racial group, but it's more of a subsistence uh, uh, group uh, and, and a way to unite uh, to survive this terrible climate. Mm -hmm. Because it is this protection system and it, and it has its own honor based upon its leadership, mm. um, they had a serious problem with intiqam revenge. Mm. And once blood was shed between two tribes, they could fight for the next 50 years, which would, doesn't really make sense. But you know, in a tribal uh, honor system, it becomes very important. So that is the negative part you know, of, of, of the tribal you know, system. And then if a larger enemy is attacking an area, uh, it would be easy to defeat them because they're yeah, broken into out. tribes. They're not united. Yeah. So therefore, they could never form uh, a major entity, a major nation like the Persians or the Romans or the Aksumite Ethiopians. Mm. They couldn't do it because they were too divided into small uh, factions and groups. So this really is a negative part. Sometimes people split hairs. They, they, they have these tiny differences, you know, which are not really differences, uh, but which keeps them divided for a long yeah. time. Uh, and so, unless you have some uniting constitution or belief system, uh, you will stay hopelessly divided. When you look at the Arabian Peninsula, uh, we see Yemen um, in the deep south, mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, you know, north, which is by Syria, you, and then this desert area, and then you have the Red Sea, which, you know, which is on the west. And, and so, um, there were trade routes that were going from the south to the north, and from the north to the south. Generally, you know, they would be trading the frankincense and the myrrh uh, from the south because in Oman and Hadramaut uh, and these regions in the south in Yemen, yeah. uh, they had this, um, you know, type of incense. Mm. It's almost like Canadians have maple syrup. Yeah. And so you cut it off the tree, it drips. Yeah. So they had a type of syrup as well, but when you cut it off and it forms a very tough uh, substance, if you burn it, it releases a smell mm. that kills bad odors. Mm. And it's got sort of a spiritual mm. nature to it as well. There's another form uh, of luban that they have. There's another form that's a little bit gummy. Yeah. And so they would take it and they would cut a little piece off and then chew it. Mm. So that was your original chewing gum, your yeah. juicy fruits. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was actually first started down in the south. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is that you could travel thousands of miles with this substance in your bag and it's okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go bad. And so everybody wanted this. The Christians wanted it for their churches, the Buddhists, the Hindus, everybody wanted it for their spiritual centers to have this smell. The rich and the famous wanted to have uh, this smell uh, for their houses, to, to keep their houses, you know, having a good smell, and also their breath 
uh, to have a good breath. So this is became part of high civilization. Mm. So the Arabs would then trade it from the south. It would go along the coast, the Red Sea coast, uh, and then to the north, uh, and then they would trade, um, you know, on you know the the coast in mainly in the area called Gaza, mm. you know, today. And we we will go more into Sham, this uh, Sham overall, know, later yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, but that's basically the area they would trade, you know, up and down the Romans and the Greeks. And the Phoenicians, they would meet them on the coast, mm. and then there, they would have different metals and you know different uh, objects that were needed, you know, by the Arabs at the time, the leathers that were needed, and uh, different um, you know gemstones and things that the Arabs could use at the time. So it was a brisk trade mm. um, that continued, you know, for hundreds of years. So so Mecca is really more toward it's going toward the center. Yeah. Um, uh, but it is sort of halfway in a sense when you're on your way up. Mm -hmm. And in order to understand what Mecca was, it's, it's basically a desolate valley. Mm -hmm. And those who have been in deserts know they're not all nice, evenly formed sand dunes. Yeah. But in deserts, there's flat areas, there's valleys, there's mountains, there's all types of things that are in deserts. And in order to understand this desolate valley that was known as Becca, because mm. Becca was the original name. We have to go into the story of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, Prophet Abraham, mm. because it is there that this desolate valley actually took shape um, and became like a city itself. But in ancient times, uh, it was known as a valley uh, that is there, not too far from the coast, but in that. Yeah. So he's yeah. not an Arab. Yeah. It's a very important point. Mm. And so he travels around. And um, in his travels, he, he ends up in Egypt on the Nile Valley. Mm. And the, the Nile had been taken over, according to some historians, by the Hyksos, the Amalekah, yeah. who actually came from Iraq as well. And it's a long story, but they eventually befriended him and um, they had captured a number of Egyptians, because mm. the Egyptians are African people, by the mm. way, clearly. Mm -hmm. And um, they had captured, you know, some of the nobility. And there are some accounts that say that he was given uh, a, a princess mm. from a royal family, Hajar uh, was her name. And then later on, uh, because Sarah could not have children, um, uh, Sarah gave Hajar uh, to Ibrahim as a wife. Mm. So, so at that point, Ibrahim, Abraham had two wives. He had Sarah on one side and he had Hajar on the other side. Yeah. And he went back to the Palestine area. Hajar actually got pregnant mm -hmm. and she conceived Ismail. Ishmael is known you know, in the Western world. Yeah. And so uh, Sarah stayed in, in, in Palestine and Ibrahim, you know, with direction from the Creator, went south. And this is recorded even in the Psalms, in what is left of the Bible. Yeah. Um, and Becca is the name that is being used. Becca is used also within the Quran, the Quran yeah. itself. Uh, so Ibrahim and Hajar and Ismail went to the desert. Uh, they went south. He was commanded by God. They ended up in the valley. And uh, Ibrahim, after a while, he had to leave uh, to go back to his other wife, who was in Palestine. This is all under divine direction. Yeah. And he leaves Hajar in the valley, and it's it's very hot and, and very barren. And Ismail is digging in the ground, uh, and water is coming, and so Zamzam water appears. Mm. Okay, so now when when Zamzam appears, gushing out, this now changes the desolate valley mm. into an object of attraction yeah. for the caravans, and so literally from distances you could see birds flying towards this area. That's a sign of water. Yeah. And so the tribes, al Arab al Ariba, who are coming from the south on the caravan routes, they realize their animals, you know, are tending toward this area. Mm. Birds and their scouts went there and they realized there's water in this valley. Mm -hmm. So they came to the valley and they settled uh, in this area. And it is reported that Ismail uh, uh, salam, he actually married from the Jurhum uh, which is one of the Arab al Arab tribes uh, there. And so the settlements now started to form uh, with the pure Arabs coming from the south and then the family of Ibrahim uh, alayhi salam. So Mecca now takes a different shape. Mm -hmm. It becomes a stop off point on your way north or your way south. Yeah. And by the very nature of stop off points, 
um, it becomes a center of trade. Yeah. Because people will drop their goods, they will pay for food, they will pay for water. Yeah. And so it started to, to grow and people came from areas, other areas to be in the area of Mecca. It's still in this valley, but it, it takes on, um, you know, a, 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 a economic base. Mm -hmm. And later, with the building of the Kaaba itself by Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know, and his son, um, it takes on religious, hmm. you know, sense in that the Kaaba or the house of worship was built there. So therefore, a, it, it changes from a desolate valley into now uh, a trade center, a religious center, uh, a, a center of the meeting of different peoples, hmm. uh, and it becomes a very important city. Hmm. Ismail alayhi salam, he learned Arabic from the Jurham. Yeah. This is interesting. Yeah. He learned to speak Arabic. So he was not an Arab. Mustariba. He's, He's Mustariba. Mustariba. So he yeah. learns to speak Arabic. Uh, and then his children now uh, become natural Arabic speaking people. Mm. But when you look at the genealogy, because I think it's always important to look at the root of the people, the uh, mother of uh, Ismail was an African mm -hmm. from a noble family in Africa, yeah. Egypt. Uh, the father was Iraqi. Mm. for Tigris Euphrates region. So this is, these are two major civilization bases. Meeting together. So it's a meeting together of the Tigris Euphrates, the Nile Valley, and the pure Arabs of the South. SubhanAllah. So the combination of these civilization bases forms the tribe of Quraysh. Mm. So the nobility is not a racial one. Because there is no, if you do DNA, right? You're going to see African DNA. You're going to see uh, uh, Mesopotamian DNA. You're going to see um, Arab DNA. It's a mixture, but it is really the, the position that they have. And then uh, being in that position, they, they develop a type of dialect as well, mm. their way of speaking Arabic because of the prominence of their city. Uh, and so they become, that is what they're now considered to be noble people. When you look at human beings, you will find that there's a natural belief in one God. And prophets were sent to all the nations and the tribes of around the world. Mm. But there's a tendency for people to worship material things. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a human weakness in the sense that you follow your senses, your taste, your smell, your sight, you know, your hearing. Yeah. And so sun worship was one of the biggest forms of worship in the ancient world. And also idol worship. Now, places where people live near rivers, they would tend to worship the river itself. Places like in West Africa, they have this baobab tree mm. as a very big base. They would worship this tree, trees. In the desert itself, because you don't have a lot of physical objects in front of you, they would tend to move toward uh, sun worship or they would create their own idols. Mm. So literally they would form structures because they didn't have the trucks, structures like the Baobab tree or, yeah. or the Great River or things like that. So they would form structures and, and they would worship to the sun through these structures mm. or eventually they would actually worship um, the structure itself. There are some uh, traditions that say that um, there was, for instance, in a particular tribe, uh, a great teacher who taught them the belief in one God, and when he died, uh, then people wanted to continue, you know, so they would talk about him. The next generation comes along and uh, would say, okay, could you draw a picture of him or some Three sort minus of, of him. And then yeah. eventually they would make a, why don't you make a statue of him mm. so we could actually know how he looked. The next generation comes along and the only thing they have left is this uh, of this teacher is the statue. Mm. So they start to worship the statue. Mm. And many idol worshippers will tell you that uh, we're not just worshipping the idol, we're, we're worshipping the Creator through the idols. And that's shirk. Mm. So that is when you associate partners with God, you do believe in an in a, in a, a, a eternal being. And the word Allah, the concept of Allah was amongst the Arabs. But they went through the different um, idols and the demigods that they had in order to get uh, to the Creator, and that is classical uh, polytheism. So even though uh, the Kaaba itself was established by Prophet Ibrahim salam for the belief in one God, with this generational weakness that people have, 
they went back into this idol worship mm. in order to deal with the different issues facing them. Mm. The Arabs who traveled north uh, and did business with the um, Byzantines, with the Romans and the Greeks, yeah. they came in contact with Christianity because we recognize the fact that in 325 AD, Constantine, who was the Roman e uh, emperor, mm. okay, the power of Rome shifted from Italy to Constantinople. Mm. And Constantine brought the bishops together in 325, they put together the modern day Bible, they chose the Trinity as their belief, yeah. and they began to spread this with Roman power. Mm -hmm. So the Roman missionaries went all the way up the Nile, uh, and they reached Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. All that region there in Africa, they, they were in different places. And the remnants of those Christians who did not accept the Trinity, they also hid and ran away to different parts of the world. So therefore, the Arabs who were in the middle, in, you know, they would, would, they had some contact, you know, with the main Trinitarians of the Byzantines. Yeah. But they also met Christians who believed in one God. Mm. So there was no unified teachings that um, that they had at that time, but they had come in contact with them. We we have to recognize the fact that. Um, the, you know, communication was very weak at the time. Yeah. So the Arabs living in the Arabian Peninsula did not have that much of an understanding of what Rome actually was. They did not have that much of an understanding of Persia itself. Now, the Arabs who, who went on the, on the peripheries, on the borders, they came in more contact, you know, with Rome and Persia um, and, and with Ethiopia. But in the center, they looked at them as foreigners um, who were coming from different lands, people do business with, yeah. um, they had their own beliefs, but they didn't really give much prominence uh, mm -hmm. to it. You know, we don't have written literature, you know, from amongst them. Yeah. And, and from the oral literature uh, that has come in the poetry, that there's not much um, discussion about, about Christianity itself, yeah. you know, a, 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 as a way of life. In the Arabian Peninsula, especially in Mecca and Hijaz area, uh, religion is tied with economics mm -hmm. because Mecca itself was not only a religious center uh, where the people would put their idols because yeah. Mecca, uh, the Kaaba eventually had 360 idols put in it. People would take a stone even from Mecca or the Kaaba area, take it back to their village and make an idol out of it. Mm. Um, but they would also do business. So, so religion was connected to their business. Um, we couldn't say that they had much spirituality in a sense. Yeah. They didn't really care. They figured you live and you die and, um, you know, it's based on power. Yeah. Um, we don't really get much spirituality coming from uh, the people, you know, living in, in the center of Arabia. Yeah. But again, the peripheries, the people on the peripheries, they did come in contact with other nations um, and they started to change yeah. to the point where just before the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu there were people called the Hanif, the Hunafa. Yeah. So these were people who were not idol worshippers. They believed in one God. Uh, they were not mainstream Christians. They were not Jews. They believed in one God. And, um, but they didn't have an actual identity itself. Mm. You also have in the South, in the Yemen, because, because of Yemen being in the South and the trade routes, uh, at some points, they were conquered by the Persians, mm. and there is discussion about um, a, a Jewish king, uh, uh, Nuas, you know, who took mm. over in the Yemen area. So Judaism was there, and then the, the Christianity of the, the Ethiopians uh, came across. So down in the south, um, there was contact that's different than in, in Arabia, but because of the lack of communications, mm. um, what goes on in Yemen uh, doesn't affect the people yeah. really in the center of Arabia. Maybe every two, three years you, you get some information, mm. you know, about what happens uh, in the Yemen, but they didn't have direct contact. Okay. Generally speaking, when we look at Mecca and again, the nobility, which is coming yeah. out of the family of Ismail alayhi salam, you know, who had a number of sons. He had like, you know, 12 sons, mm. 10, 12 sons, you know, so from his family and then Jurhum, you know, and, and the other tribes, because there were other Arab al Araba from the Yemen who were coming into Mecca as well. Mm -hmm. And you even have struggle that goes on between the different tribes of the Arab al Araba. So, so, so it, it is within this milieu, this mixture of people that the Quraysh um, took the leadership. And one of the descendants of Ismail in particular, whose name was Qusay, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, Kosei um, was a very organized type of person. So he actually developed um, ministries where, where he would give ministries for feeding people, for giving water, you know, military, political. Uh, so he, he sort of set ministries there, which is the basis of our organized uh, society. And then, you know, it, it is through his um, descendants um, that these ministries uh, started to actually take form. And, and out of Kosei's sons, um, you see different people who are ruling um, the ministries. Um, it's a long, complicated story, but basically, uh, his one of his sons, Abdu'l-Manaf, mm. um, he was able to seize authority and, and to be one of the major, if not the major leader mm. uh, in uh, Mecca at the time. And he especially was in charge of uh, feeding pilgrims and, and giving water. Yeah. And obviously, when you're in a desert, uh, water and food is one of the most important yeah. thing uh, in life. It's more important than clothing or anything like yeah. that. You have to survive. So Abdu'l-Manaf uh, really you know, organized um, himself. And that leadership that was coming from you know, Kusei, coming from the Quraysh, because this is all part of the Quraysh lineage, yeah. Um, they are the prominent people, um, you know, who are in charge of the leadership. You have the the, the, the masses of the people who are there, um, but the ones who control the ministries are coming from the the, the Quraysh, coming from Abdul Manaf's family. Mm. Um, they even struggle with each other. Mm. Uh, some of them, Abdul Dar and Abdul Uzza, they you know, they struggle with Abdul Manaf. Yeah, you know, over power. And even Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu even witnessed this struggle that went on you know, between the different um, families of Quraysh or sections of Quraysh that, that were, were power groups because mm. they were controlling ministries. Mm. When you look at the different uh, areas of leadership, yeah, uh, whether it be the, 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 the water, sakaya, the water yeah. or feeding, um, or whether it was a nadwa, was it was oh. the political leadership, liwa, yeah. which is really military leadership, it sort of shapes personalities. And, and, so, and so the people who controlled <coughs> the political leadership and the military leadership, they ruled more with power and fear. Mm. But the people who controlled the water and the feeding, they would be they would be loved by, by the masses of the people. Yeah. And that is where um, the great descendant uh, of Ismail coming out of Abdul Manaf, <clears throat> that is his son Hashim, mm. where Hashim comes in. Hashim is a key individual because he took over uh, as the leader of the, the, the feeding, you know, of, of the people, giving water. And, and because of this, and something within his personality, some even say there was something about the look, mm. you know, of this particular son and, and his descendants. People gravitated toward them. Mm-hmm. So he was really um, the first to establish organized trade routes from north to south. Okay, so this very important thing that you know that he did, it was there before from time yeah. immemorial, but he really organized it, and, and he really made it a key part of, of the economics, you know, of uh, uh, Mecca itself, and so he was he was beloved by the people. He eventually uh, went north. He married a woman, uh, Salma, you know, from Yathrib was was Medina, and then surprisingly enough, he, he died in Gaza. Mm. So that's how important Gaza is to us. We mm-hmm. can never forget Gaza. Mm-hmm. So he actually died uh, up there, you know, in that area on the coast. He was doing his trade. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so this is how that connection was there. And these are very important points because uh, the younger, our younger generation has to make the connection between what is happening in Palestine today, in Gaza, other parts. You have to connect it directly with our history, with Sira, with the Prophet Sallallahu so that these places, no matter what happens to them physically, they will never be forgotten mm-hmm. because they are a key part of our history mm-hmm. and a key part uh, of the lineage of our, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu These are the things that unite us as Muslims. His name was Amr, yeah. actually, yeah. Uh, itself. Yeah. But then he takes on that name. And, and, and Hashem's important. Mm. If you get a Jordanian passport, it says the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. That's right. If you are a king in Morocco, uh, you say that you're, you know, Hashemite. Mm-hmm. The Ayatollahs 
in Iran that wear black turbans. Mm. They claim to be Hashemites. Yep. Um, the Mahdi that we believe will come at the end of time, you know, will be coming from Benu Hashem. Benu Hashem. I mean, so this is very important concepts that we link mm. uh, these together with what is happening to us today.